Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Toastmasters Bay to Bay, where we feature speakers from San Francisco all the way down to Monterey and beyond. My name is Stan Ng, and I'm your host for this episode. Tonight, we have an extraordinary episode. We start with our usual speaker and evaluator format, and then we'll show you an out outside the studio video. And then the second half of the program will feature three seasoned speakers talking about tips that will help you be more effective in your everyday speaking. So let's get right down to it. Our first speaker tonight will be working from the Speaking to Inform manual. And Vaishali Sirke will be giving her speech a civics lesson from my parents. Please help me welcome Vaishali. Thank you, Sam. According to a report by the United States Census Bureau, roughly 64% of voter age Americans actually voted in the last presidential election in 2008. Why not 100%? Well, the California Voter Foundation attempted to find out, and their survey revealed that one of the top reasons that Americans gave for not voting is thinking that their vote did not matter. Now, I learned from a very young age that your vote does indeed matter, and that it's critically important to engage in the political process. I didn't learn this lesson in an AP government class in high school. I learned it from my parents. My parents came to the United States in the late 60s and early 70s. And as soon as they were able to, they attained their citizenship and they registered to vote. Now, of all the lessons that my parents attempted to teach me as I was growing up, voting was not one of them. <laughs> you see, for my parents, engaging in their civic duty was a no-brainer. They couldn't imagine not voting, so they saw no need to call special attention to the importance of voting. As a matter of fact, I remember from a very young age overhearing my parents' conversations about candidates and platforms and issues facing the United States. Now, I didn't eavesdrop for very long because in those days, I found politics to be incredibly boring. And I just could not understand why my parents would spend so much time talking about candidates and platforms and issues facing the United States. Well, before I continue, let me explain the political process as it took place in my parents' house. One of my parents is a registered Democrat. The other one is a registered Republican. <laughs> now, this was done on purpose because our household had a vote in every single presidential election. Now, before any primary, my parents would get together and discuss all the candidates and what they stood for and what the issues were facing the U.S. and who was the best person to address those issues, and they would agree on which candidate said parent would vote for. It wasn't my mother's vote, it wasn't my father's vote, but it was their vote together. And before every general election, my parents would do the same thing. They would sit down, they would discuss the candidates, and they would vote, both of them, for the same person. My parents did not want their votes to cancel each other out. You see, my parents voted as a block. <laughs> well, as I grew older, my father finally explained their political process, and I was astounded. I didn't realize that they thought so deeply and so carefully about how to vote and why it was important to vote. I thought it was just something they just did. As a matter of fact, when I first became eligible to vote and my dad took me down to the polling station, he proudly announced to everybody, my daughter is here voting for her very, in her very first election. <laughs> now, instead of feeling the requisite embarrassment, I actually felt my father's pride. Because there I was, amongst all these other people, engaging in the political process together. It was very exciting. And it didn't even matter who the candidates were that you voted for. What mattered is that we were all doing this together. And that was a very powerful lesson for me to learn. I learned another very powerful lesson about engaging in the political process from my mother. When I was in grade school, the very outspoken and charismatic mayor of New York City, Edward Koch, was running for re-election. And one day, my mother had to take both me and my younger brother to a political ra rally in Flushing Meadow Park. 
It was hot and sunny, but we were doing our very best to cheer on the mayor in his re-election bid. Well, my mother was there, of course, with a handmade sign on which were painted the words, how am I doing just fine? And towards the end of his speech, Mayor Koch looked at my mother, pointed at her and shouted, how am I doing? And we all chanted back, just fine. <laughs> it was very exciting. It was a wonderful moment for all of us at the rally. But for me, it was almost surreal because I saw there that my mother's political voice was heard and acknowledged. And in my own childish understanding, I got it. The mayor was counting on my mother's vote, and he knew he had it. But likewise, my mother was counting on the mayor to do right by the people of New York City. And she knew that her vote was one step towards achieving that end. What I learned that day, that hot sunny day in the park, was that in the political process, the candidates and the voters are on equal footing. They are accountable to each other. Put very simply, friends, your voice is important, and your vote is your voice. Our voices, our votes, are our most powerful way of communicating with the candidates who want to do something for our communities, our city, our country. Sometimes I thought, maybe my vote doesn't matter, because the state that I was living in, its electoral votes would traditionally go towards one party or the other. But I knew that my vote mattered because it was a lesson, a very simple lesson that my parents taught me years ago. To this day, my parents still very carefully plan out how they're going to vote in every election because they knew that their vote mattered. I vote because it's my civic duty to vote, but I also vote because it's my parents' legacy. My vote is my voice. And I know that though I live in California, and my parents still live in New York City, come election day, 3,000 miles apart, we'll both be doing the same thing. And I hope that all of you will join me, my parents, and millions of other Americans across this great country on election day to vote. Because your vote is your voice, and your voice must be heard on election day. Thank you. Charlie, thank you so much for, the, for that inspiring speech, especially in this election season. Mm -hmm. I want to ask, did your, were your parents politically engaged before they immigrated to the U.S.? They were, as a matter of fact. I know that my father certainly was, and my mother was, because um, her father was in the police force in Mumbai. So oh, okay. being politically active is a value that my parents do. It's interesting that they decided to vote as a block because, as you say, they don't want to split the vote. Were, was there any, have they always come to an agreement on which side to vote for? Or has there ever been a split vote? No, my parents actually never vote along party lines. They sit and they discuss everything. My father loves watching the political shows. All the political shows, the right wing, the left wing, the middle, the liberal, everything. And, and the conventions. The, and the conventions. <laughs> <laughs> I can bet they were watching the conventions. So I know that they really take the time to discuss everything. And they're very aware of current events and America's role in the world. So with you and your brother reaching voting age, did they continue the tradition? Is this now a four-strong voting bloc? Well, my brother and I vote very selfishly <laughs> as we vote our conscience. My parents still vote as a bloc. And as a matter of fact, my father still remains politically active. He's retired now, mm -hmm. but he's out there rallying the seniors of New York City oh, wow. to get out there and vote. That, that's, that's really admirable. Thank you. Uh, so um, what, what club are you with? I'm with Cupertino Toastmasters. And do you keep it political in that club? Or <laughs> do you just we have a very safe environment at Cupertino Toastmasters where you can feel free to express an opinion and in your evaluations you will not get attacked for your opinion but you know for how you say it. I, I, th <laughs> I think that's that's very admirable. I think that it's it's all in the discourse. Absolutely. Not, not necessarily trying to shout each other down. Right? Exactly. And I believe that's part of the political process being able to speak and have our opinions heard by other people great, without great worry of recrimination. Well, thank you very much for that speech. Thanks so much, Stan. Thank you. Thank you.
Toastmasters, we like to evaluate everybody's speech. So here to give an evaluation of the speech you just heard is Adriana Baca, who is a member of G Toast. Please help me welcome Adriana. Thank you, Stan. Hello, fellow Toastmasters and viewers at home, and especially Bishali. Bishali. Your speech was very enjoyable, and I found myself just captivated with your energy that you brought to the stage and the message that you also imparted with us. I want to tell you that your face just lights up when you're up here speaking, and you have such a tremendous energy. And when you deliver your message, it really kind of leaves the audience with something to really think about and kind of take ownership of as well. Now, you're a great speaker, that's no doubt. I have a long list of things that I've written down for you that I particularly think that you did well. You're an advanced speaker, and so what my job tonight for, to do for you is to try to give you something to work on, some tools that you can kind of use to take you to that next level with your speaking, because I know you're already good. You have so many great things that you do with your speaking. One of the things I wanted to point out was you, you have a lot of good gestures a lot of good body movement. And at, at times I kind of felt like, you know, you do such a good job with your hand gestures that it almost makes me kind of want to tell you just to kind of like tell your thumbs to say hello to your thighs and kind of <laughs> return to a neutral stance just for a few, not all the time, because I, I just think that just doing this will help bring more natural, um, make your gestures a little bit more natural. And I think you do that well. The other thing I wanted to kind of impart with you is try to create a hologram. I know nowadays like, they do this thing where Tupac Shakur, you know, he, people who've passed away, they have um, holograms that they do concerts with. And even though that, that artist is no longer with us, it's, you, people attend these concerts and they feel like some, the person's actually there giving a concert. And I think you could do that with this sort of speech here. You know, use the center of the stage to try to you know, impart the information, the lessons, the information, and then create a hologram with your mom, you know, in the audience. Create, use a, a different part of the stage to, to create that hologram so that the audience will be, you'll, you'll see when you're up here speaking that the audience will start looking at this person like that you've created. And I think if you do that, it's just gonna take your speaking to a whole nother level. You already have so much information and so many great lessons for us. I think just doing that, just have your thumbs say hello to your thighs every now and again, just to make your gestures seem a little bit more natural, I think you're going to do great. Thank and you. I look forward to hearing you speak again. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adriana. Thank you. Well, I hope you learned a little bit from that evaluation. You, you'll find that when you become a Toastmaster, you match the style of your speaking to your stage. If it's a huge stage, you would behave differently than in an intimate stage. Let's take a look at a video now in which we have yet a third situation you'll find interesting. Uh, I would now request Jim to read out objectives of P3. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow members, and most welcome guests. Uh, Gary's project is Get to the Point. Well, what we just did is we had a telepresence meeting what's called a point-to-point -point meeting. So we had two rooms. Half the room is here in San Jose, and the other half that we had was in Singapore. And this is a great idea for Toastmasters. I would like to see these meetings occurring at least once a quarter. That's how we bring it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. It's essential that Toastmasters learn how to communicate through these new tools. And I think I'd love to see a manual come out, an advanced speaking manual from Toastmasters on emphasizing points. How do we communicate with these new yeah, tools? a lot of information about genomes and singularity and stuff like that. So what I will be doing is to share. I was expecting that we would have delays in our conversation, but no, it's just like we're talking across the table. So this is great. I'm glad to be a part of it. Technologies like this are going to get more and more popular, and you'll see different ideas popping up and the way we communicate in the future is going to change and I think we're really on to, on to the future here. And what brings us together 
is this movement called Toastmaster. And we learn communication and leadership to enhance our communication skills where we can bring all these skills back to our workplace, back to our family and back to our society. I think we're breaking into something new. This is going to be a way that we all need to be comfortable in communicating in the future. And before long, there'll be lots of other Toastmaster meetings occurring like this. Focusium, one R, three N. Vish, one soul. Giri, three R, one M. Seven soul. Shopping, four N. So collaboration is wonderful. Believe in the power of collaboration, and you can definitely achieve more. Thank you so much. Thank you. The major paradigm shift of the Homo sapiens is just around the corner. Welcome to the new world. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. It's good to see you. Have a good day. <laughs> Welcome back. I hope you got a little bit of, of a taste of what it's like to host a remote meeting. What goes on at a Toastmasters meeting? We have speeches and evaluations and educational topics. We have three educational topics for you tonight with three seasoned speakers expounding on them. First, we have Rajiv Prabhakar, who's going to talk about vocal variety. Help me welcome Rajiv. Thank you, Stan. Have you ever watched a speaker who is just energetic, enthusiastic, having a fun time up here? How did it feel for you as the audience member? Were you having fun yourself? I like to call it the most basic rule of public speaking. If you're having your fun time up here, if you bring your energy, your audience will like it. So, what is one good way to really bring your energy and also appear confident at the same time? My tip, really projecting your voice. Throughout the day, we're constantly and subconsciously projecting a voice louder or softer, depending on how close or far away the person we're talking to is. And one tip that I find really helps me when I'm public speaking is to imagine myself talking to someone who's standing at the very back of the room. This helps you to just naturally project your voice all the way and fill the entire venue. Now, of course, if you're talking really loudly and in a flat voice the entire time, your audience will get very bored and completely tune you out which is why it's really important to vary both the volume and pace of your voice. In Toastmasters, we call it vocal variety. But did you know that you can use vocal variety in a way to aid the message of your speech as well? Let's say I'm trying to build a personal connection with the audience. I want to seem like a nice, friendly, personable person. You can do that by talking in a very slow and soft voice. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, if I'm trying to build energy, excitement, momentum in the room, I can do that by talking really quickly and loudly. And of course, if you want to appear commanding, authoritative, like you know what you're talking about, you can do that by talking loudly and slowly. Now, I know I mentioned that three different ways, but I actually have one additional bonus tip for you as well, to add even more variety to your speech. And that is pauses. Now there are two ways you can use pauses in your speech. Let's say you want to build anticipation and suspense in your audience. You can do that by pausing right before you give the key point. The second way you can do it is right after you've said something really important and you want the audience to really know what, that you've said something really important. Take a second to pause right after you've said it. This gives the audience time to reflect and really let the message sink in. Well, those were my tips, and I really hope to hear the next set of tips from Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Now we have Mark Stiving, who will talk about the importance of eye contact. Mark. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and anyone out there who wants their next speech to have impact. <laughs> In order to have impact, you must connect with your audience. And connection requires eye contact. 
Now many people when they do eye contact think, oh I need a few seconds with each person or maybe some people think I need a whole sentence and I'm going to roll that on. And the truth is there isn't a hard and fast rule. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You can vary it just like that vocal variety we heard about a second ago. All you need to do is make sure you have eye contact. Now you're wondering to yourself, how is it that I practice my eye contact? Because I'm not very good at it and what do I need to do? Okay, get out your stuffed animal collection. <laughs> you know you have one. Get your beanie babies out and set them up around the room. And now it's time to practice your speech. And you're going to look straight into one of your animals and say a phrase. And then you'll look into another one of your animals and say something else. Do this several times and you'll get much more comfortable with your eye contact. Eventually, when you feel comfortable, go ahead and get out a video recorder. Tape yourself giving that speech. And here's what you're going to see. You're going to see that great eye contact, and then you're going to go like this. Because you were thinking about the next thing you wanted to say. And guess what? We have a great clue here, too. All you have to do is look at one of your animals while you're thinking. Because what that looks like is one of those absolutely awesome pauses that Rajiv just told us about. So instead of looking like you're trying to figure out what the next thing is you want to say, <laughs> look at somebody in the audience and they'll think it was an intentional pause. It works exceptionally well. So my friends, they say that the eyes are the windows to the soul. In your next speech, make your eyes the door to your impact. Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. All Toastmasters know of the tragic heartbreak of filler words. <laughs> are you wondering what a filler word is? Well, here's co-producer Birgit Starman to fill you in. <laughs> Birgit. Thank you, Stan. So, you know, like, I'm going to be telling you a story. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> you're going to think, um, this is really important. Are you rolling your eyes at me yet? <laughs> <laughs> when is she going to be done? A filler word is a verbal tick. It could be an ah, an um, a you know. The worst I've ever heard is a ma. <laughs> that particular speaker, after every sentence, said a ma. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that you want to do is make sure that you're not distracting your audience when you're speaking. Now, why do speakers have these verbal tics or these filler words? I would say the majority of speakers don't even know that they're using them. They're simply nervous, and they're standing up there, or they're thinking. And some speakers are actually afraid of pausing, because if they feel that they pause, somebody might be taking out their Blackberry, or they'll lose them. They don't know the power of the pause, so they're always trying to fill everything, that, uh, the, the entire thing, with some kind of a sound. And it ends up being, you know, um, uh. Now the thing is, there are some very legitimate words as well that can also become filler words if you overuse them. My example is so. So if I were to start every sentence with the same word, then you would say, so, you know, so, is she done yet? <laughs> Again, <laughs> the word so can have a legitimate meaning. But the thing is, you don't want to overuse it to the point where it becomes another verbal tick. Now, how do you get rid of these filler words? Awareness is key. The first thing that you do is you go to Toastmasters meeting, and then you get an evaluator to tell you exactly what your filler word is. Now, the rule of thumb is if you're using more than five, the evaluator would just say, your filler word is so, or your filler word is um, something like that. Uh, that. That makes you aware of it. The other thing is you should actually record yourself. If you're listening to yourself on audio, or if you are watching yourself on video, you can see whether or not you're actually using these particular filler words. Now, the thing about that is you need to be honest with yourself. <laughs> it's very easy to say, yeah, that use of so is totally legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> we all do it. We all want to ignore the fact that we're actually using these filler words. 
Now, the other thing is, the more you speak and the more you practice, the less filler words you're actually going to be using. Again, you need to be honest with yourself about the, that use of filler word. Because the point is, you want to make your speech as clean as possible. But the thing is, if you're giving a half hour presentation for work, most likely there's going to be an ah or an um in there somewhere. The point is not to be distracting. Because when you're overusing those filler words, like when I first got up here, <laughs> That's very distracting. No, nobody's going to be listening to your particular message. So essentially, to make your message heard, you need to make sure that you really reduce those number of filler words. And then, if you want to use them for effect, um, then at least you're making the effect that you had intended, not making people say, when is she going to be done? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Dear. Well, before I forget, I'm going to mention a couple of URLs for you. The first is www.d4tm.org, where you can find out news about the local district from San Francisco down to Monterey. And we also have uh, another website for our umbrella organization, www.toastmasters.org, where you can find out more about the Toastmasters program. What is in a Toastmasters meeting? Somebody had told me once that uh, the great benefit to Toastmasters is an opportunity to speak. Well, I say that's bunk. Because if you want to, you can always set up a box in the middle of the park, <laughs> climb on top of it, and start <laughs> ranting. <laughs> but nobody is going to come up to you and give you an evaluation on your rant. <laughs> that's what we do at Toastmasters, though. You, we give you an entire ecosystem in which you can perform a speech, get evaluation, get feedback, and education, too. So what you saw tonight comprised all the important parts of a Toastmasters meeting. A chance to speak, yes, but also evaluation, feedback, and also tips on speaking. That does it for us. Good night. <laughs>